Lord, I choose to obey your word, for as I dwell and walk in your presence, I shall not lack. Poverty be far from me and my household in Jesus' name. I will walk in your blessings, Lord. I will rise above all that hail has to offer and accept heaven's best here on earth. Everything I set my hands to will prosper because I make you my dwelling place. You are my refuge and my fortress. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. I accept it by faith, fully expecting your blessings in every area of my life. For wherever your presence is, there is no lack. Therefore, Lord, as we receive today's offering, we are believing you for abundant harvest, health, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, scholarships and grants, inventions with royalties, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increase, bargains and child support. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of our financial needs that we may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, I've been on four-letter words now for what? For six or eight weeks, it seems like, and I'm, I'm going there today, but I think we're about done with four-letter words. But if you're going to preach on hell, then you've almost got to preach on heaven. So I'm not really going to preach on heaven. I'm going to preach today on love, okay? You know, it's one of those topics that you could preach on a lot, and a lot of churches do that, and I'm not necessarily guilty of preaching what a lot of other preachers preach. But you know... Uh, the thing about love, the opposite of that is hate. And the thing about hate is, you know, hell was created for those who are involved in that, in that mode, all right, the hate mode. But now heaven is a result of love, okay? For any of us that plans on going to heaven, and I do, all right, I got my reservation made, amen? I pray today that you do as well. And I'm going to go there because God loves me, okay? That'll be the only reason that I get to go. The only reason that any of us are going to be in heaven is because God loved us. Now, the most popular, familiar scripture probably in the whole world is John 3, 16, and probably virtually everyone in this room knows that scripture. Many of you, if I ask you how many scriptures you know by heart, some, there are a lot of individuals who will only come back with this one, John 3, 16, because it's the one that we see and we hear all right, the most, and it is preached on a lot. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You probably should never read 16 without re reading verse 17, because it says that God didn't uh, send His Son to condemn the world, but that through His Son the world could be saved. It's out of His love, though, God's love for us. You know, most of us in this group, we grew up hearing a song on the radio, uh, and it said, what's love got to do with it? I won't sing it to you because I'm not a singer, but a lot, I got a lot of smiles right then. How many of you remember that song? What's love got to do with it? Well, the answer is everything. When you get right down to it, love is the answer to everything. And I, as a pastor... For years now, I've, I've prayed and I've asked God, God, how can I motivate our people to come to church more? How can I motivate our people to study their Bible more? How can I motivate? I've always asked God, how can I motivate? Because I've learned by our human nature that most of the time we need motivated before we do anything. You know, you don't just go out and mow your grass because you love to mow. No, you're motivated when it gets up about this tall and your wife says, when are you going to mow the yard? Right? And that, so sometimes you got double motivation because you're tired of looking at it the way it looked and then your wife got on to you so it's like, and then some of us were like, well, you know, you can mow it if you want to, but that don't go very far. It gets you in trouble. You know, and that's, that's not the kind of love that God wants us to express. But the fact is that love is the greatest motivational thing there is in the whole world, love is. When you love something, when you love somebody, I'm telling you, you'll go to great ends to make that happen. Those of you in this room that have been married for a long time, like Susan and I, listen, not, it, I, I fell in love with her 
It motivated me to date her, motivated me to marry her, has motivated me to live with her, good and bad, for almost 47, 47 years. Going on and rising from there, going on. Yeah, love is a very motivational thing. What will we do for our children? Because we love them. What will we do for them? What will we do for our grandchildren? Because we love them. But you know, a harder question is, what will we do for God? Because we love Him. All right? You know what? I ask questions sometimes, and they're a little bit tough, but I get them first, so I have to answer them twice, so don't get mad at me. Love was God's motivation to send Jesus to the earth. That's why we had John 3, 16. God so loved the world. He was motivated by his love for the world. He was motivated by his love for Christine and Christine and Michael and Leanne and every one of us here. That's what motivated his love. That's what put Jesus on the cross. That's why he carried our sin there because God's love motivated him. He loved God. Now, that's a tricky thing to say because he's part God. He's God the Son, right? Jesus. But yet he loved his Father. He said, I'm a Father of one. I'm here to do the works of my Father who sent me. He went to the cross willingly because they loved us. I've learned that the more that we learn to love God, the more motivated that we will be to serve God the way that God wants us to. But if we don't learn to love God, then generally we're not motivated to excel in any spiritual category that there is. When they came to Jesus, and they, and they were trying to trick him always, that's, that's the devil, that's the devil's crew. We've all been deceived and tricked by him. And he came to Jesus, they said, what's the greatest commandments? And they were like, okay, he's got ten, he's got to pick one of them. Well, if he had to pick one of the ten, he would have picked the first one, because it said that you have no other gods before him, all right? But here Jesus answered him this way. He said that you got to love God with all your heart, soul, body, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. That's the first and, and the first and the greatest commandment, and the second liken unto it. Well, you know what? We have a hard time loving God sometimes the way that we should, and we have an even harder time loving our neighbor as ourselves. And then he added all the other commandments hang on them too. What good does it uh, do we do ourselves if we kept eight of the commandments but we didn't keep those two? What good does it do if we keep the Sabbath day holy all of our whole life but we don't love God with all our heart, soul, body, and strength? And it's amazing how that that's recorded in three Gospels because the disciples, they got it. I don't think the disciples of our day that we have truly got it the way that they did. They understand We've got to love God. We've got to learn how to love God because you know what? That's how that I learned. That's why that I love Susan. I learned to love Susan. I learned to do that by being around her. I learned to do that by listening to her. I learned to do that by us sharing experiences in our life. And the more that we did, the more that we were together, as our relationship grew, the more that we learned how to love. And I meant truly love, okay? The true love, the kind that does last for years and years and years and years. I'm, I was looking, I'm an old person, you know, so I was reading obituaries. And I noticed that on Friday that a Mathis funeral home at Dexter was burying a husband and a wife at the same time. And I thought, I wonder if they died together. It, it piqued my curiosity. No, they died within a week apart after having been married, I believe it was 67 years years. Do you know that that was a marriage that had true love in it? You do not live with somebody for 67 years, go through this world, the difficulties uh, that we face, the trials that we put up with, I'm telling you, without some true love in there. God has created us in a way that we can love. Amen. When I do weddings, and I've done a lot of them, that's one of the scriptures that I've used. And uh, something that I've shared because God created us to love, to love others, and to love Him. We were made that way. God breathed into man, right? And man became a living soul. God is love. First John chapter 4, verse 4, God is love. And so the breath of God that's inside of man and woman, me and you, 
Okay, that is love. There's the breath of love within us. We have the ability to love the God kind of way. Because what's happened in our world, I'm telling you, love has got, has got misconstrued, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And uh, most people just don't even realize what real love is, and we're going to go there probably in a little bit. I came across this in my mind, and I know it was Holy Spirit. He said, if love is the greatest thing, okay, and then that what, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13 says, now about it, these three, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. We'll come back to that scripture in a minute. So if love is the greatest thing, isn't it only natural for us to accept the fact that the devil is going to try to corrupt it any way that he can? Okay? So the best way that the devil can corrupt love is for people not to understand what love really is. And so we know that because by experience, we've all had people say, oh, I love you, and then they turn right around and stab you in the back. Or they said, I love you, all right, and all kinds of things happen. And one day they treat you really good because they love you, and the next day they treat you really bad because they love you, you know. No, you know what? How many of us have fell in love before? Let's be honest here today. How many of us fell in love? Some of you ain't being honest. How many of you fell out of love? Almost as fast as you fell in love. Gosh, I, you know, I had a, a couple girlfriends before Susan, and I was pretty crazy about them. I don't remember if I ever said, I love you or not, because I, I don't remember. I am old, you know, so I choose to forget some things in my life. But you know what? I, listen, weren't we all young and dumb? And weren't we raised in a world? You know, some of us grew up watching love is a many splendored thing. And if we thought our lives are a soap opera, then they are, because we watched them. We learned how to have soap opera lives and some of them people on there got married eight, nine, ten times, you know, and then they go back and remarry some of the others, and no wonder our world is in the mess that it is because the devil has made love something that nobody really understands. And instead of it being a motivational thing to bring us closer to God, it has been used in all kinds of ways to, to make us not want to love. Because when you get hurt by something that you don't understand, you don't want to go back there. You don't want to experience that ever again. You're like, I don't want to be a part of that no more. All right? You know, can I tell a funny story on me? All right. We used to go to grandma's all the time. Grandma Mason's at Bernie. We were there. I don't know. It's probably Easter, some special day. We all, family was there. And somebody made a German chocolate cake. I'm telling you, they made it from scratch. It was so good. I ate so much of that, I threw up going home. I'm telling you, I love that German chocolate cake. I, if they kept, I, it's a wonder I didn't eat the whole thing. I guess they probably tried to stop me. I do know that I eat too much. I also know that I didn't love German chocolate cake for a long time <laughs> after that. So I went from being in love with German chocolate cake to being out of love with it in about an hour's time. And it took me several weeks, maybe months, to get over that. Some of you have had that same experience, have you not? I pray that I never get sick on a food that I really like. Because the ones I really like, I love them things. But you know what? That's not, is that really a correct term for that use of the word love? To love an inanimate thing that we're going to put into our body? Probably not. You know, we, we get to that place where we love to go fishing, we love to go hunting, we love to play golf, we love to collect bobbleheads, we love to do all kinds of things, okay? And I guess probably in one of the many definitions of the word love that there is in the Hebrew and Greek in our Bibles, that you can probably find one that fits those. And you know what? If we don't worship them and we don't devote time and attention and take away from God with those things, God's all right with that. God expects us to enjoy good things in this life, and uh, we all do that, and that's okay. God wants us to wear a smile. Uh, God doesn't want to spend all his tithe money on something, you know, that we don't need to spend it on. He don't need, he, God doesn't want a Sunday, you know, to be filled with things that are apart from him. So you got to keep things in perspective, and that's been one of the hardest things for God's children to do in my lifetime. 
growing up, all right, you know what? When Sunday came, they didn't practice basketball. They didn't play sports. They didn't have cheerleading competitions. They didn't do the things that we now do. They didn't do them on Wednesday nights either because our world knew that Wednesday night and Sundays were important for the family because of the church, and so goes the family, so goes the church. But now all of a sudden, people love things, okay? They love to play sports. They love to go fishing. They love to go shopping. They love to do things. And so it doesn't matter what day of the week it falls on because they love it. They justify it because they're using the word love. Actually, it's being used out of context with how God wants us to experience it. And so here we are. The church struggles in our day and time, and they have. And it's one of the reasons why that our churches are failing and many have closed, simply because people don't love God enough, they don't love their church enough, and they don't love their brethren enough to support it and be there when they are supposed to according to God's Word. Amen? All right, I'm glad we're all still on the same page. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you can go back there, verses 4 through 8, without, we can read it, charity suffereth long and is kind, it envieth not, it vaunteth not itself, it's not puffed up, it doth not behave itself unseemingly, it seeketh not its own, it's not easily provoked, it thinketh no evil, all right, it rejoices not in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Now, this is a definition of what love really is. It never fails, okay? It never fails. Love never fails. Not real love. But you know what? The kind of love that we've experienced in our lifetime, that fails us. All of a sudden, we don't love anymore. People get a divorce because they say, well, I fell out of love. Were they really ever in love if they could fall out of love? Do you know when God orchestrates something in our life, it's because God has an intention for that to be a part of who you are from here on out. So if, if we married the perfect mate, I, I promise you that you can live together forever if you love God. And I'll tell, I tell young couples, you put God in your marriage, it can last forever. You leave God out of it, it's going to suffer wrong, harm, and it is subject to dissolution without God. Our world is too bad for it to survive without God. And many of you know what I'm talking about. You know what he was saying? Love is patient. It's, it's what? It's kind. It's humble. It's mannerly. It's giving. It's long-suffering. It's forgiving. It loves the truth. It's everlasting and eternal. That's just a, a long list of what we just read. Do you know what the opposite of that is? The opposite. Here's how the devil works it. Okay? It's annoying and complaining. It's mean, it's arrogant, it's disruptive, it's greedy, it wants its own way, it's unforgiving, it loves lies, it's, it's ending to life. When we're operating out of love, or when we're operating in a deceptive love that we, that we think, and that's where we get in trouble with our feelings. We think because I feel this way now that this is the way that it is. But when we know by what God's Word says when it's real love and when it's not. Real love doesn't abuse. Real love doesn't accuse. Real love doesn't complain. Real love is what? Patient, long-suffering. It puts up with stuff forever. And if you're going to be married 50 years, you've got to put up with some stuff. Don't you, Brother Al? Your wife's not here. You can greet. He's probably the only one in the room who's got me and Susan beat. I pick on him today. It's forgiving. Listen to it. It's forgiving. How hard is it for us to forgive someone that we say that we love? It bears all things, endures all things, hopes all things. Remember all that it said about love? Listen, we can survive in this world no matter what we go through, if we've got God's love that's supposed to be shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, it doesn't matter who we face, what we face, when we face, how we face it. When the love of God is in here, we can do it. We can withstand the pressure. We can get past the test. We can pass the trials. We can come through them victorious. God be for us. Who can be against us? God, If God is for us, let me clue you in today. If God is for you, it's because you love God and you're trying to serve Him. 
And if you're not loving God, trying to serve Him, how can you guarantee yourself that God is for you? It's hard message sometimes to receive. But if you want to tie the hands of God, you tie the hands of God. He's not much help to you when you tie His hands. I can't tie His hands for you, but you can tie His hands for yourself. There's one very simple scripture that you've all heard over and over again that explains that in great detail. If you love me, you keep my commandments. Does he have to say any more? What is the proof that I love God? What is the proof that you love God? We love him to the extent that we keep his commandments. Now, I'm a sliding scale kind of guy. Thank God for his love. It's full of grace and mercy, all right, and forgiveness. But on that sliding scale of God's love, how much do I really love God? How hard do I try to keep all his commandments? And the first two are the greatest ones, to love him with all my heart, soul, body, and strength, and to love my neighbor as myself. Who is my neighbor? It's whoever that I come in contact with on a daily basis. It doesn't matter how tall, how wide, how short, how thin, how heavy, how small. That's who my neighbor is. I've got to love that person just like I love me. Like I love God. But we've also learned this. <laughs> you don't love what you don't know. You do not love what you don't know or who you don't know. You don't love them. How can you love them? You can't love God if you don't know God. If you don't know God, how can you love your brother? Isn't that what Jesus said too? What uh, John wrote? How can you love God whom you haven't seen if you can't love and won't love your brother who you do see? We've got to love, but we've got to love God. I've got to learn how to love God. I've got to have relationship with Him. I've got to communicate with Him. I've got to spend time with Him. I've got to try to keep all the commandments that I can keep. I've got to learn what those commandments are that God wants me to keep. Then I can feel good. And you know what? When I feel good about what I'm doing to try to learn to love God more, and that's been one of my prayers ever since I got saved. God help me to love you more. I realize that a lot of times I'm, I haven't loved God as much as I should. And when I think about that, I have to ask myself a question. Do I love God more than I love my wife? Do I love God more than I love my children? Do I love God more than I love my grandchildren? Do I love God more than I love our church and you? Do I love God more? Sometimes us asking ourselves the hard questions is the only way that we get the right answers. Amen? Amen? Did you ever wonder how Judas could not love Jesus before he betrayed him? Did you ever wonder that? How could Judas spend three years of his life thereabouts walking with Jesus day after day after day, eating with Jesus, being fed, riding in the boat, watching the miracles, seeing everything that he did. How, how could Judas do that? Well, I have an answer for you. We'll probably come back to it for the end. You know what? Judas loved what he wanted more than what he needed. And I just gave you a description of our world. He loved what he wanted more than what he needed. Think about that one for a minute. You see, we've all got our wants, do we not? We have them. We want to go here. We want to do that. We want to buy this. We want, we want, we want. Off to work we go. He wanted what he, he loved what he wanted more than what he needed. And sometimes we do the very same thing. We love what we want more than what we need. And our greatest need is to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our body, and all our strength. You know what that is? That's all inclusive. That's everything about us. It's not about just loving in word. It's loving in word. It's loving in deed. It's loving in action. It's loving with your emotions. It's loving with your feelings. It's loving with your wisdom. 
It's loving with your knowledge. It's loving with your understanding. It's loving with everything that you are. We have to come to that place like the Apostle Paul did where he said, it's in him that I live, I move, and I have my being. Without him, I'm nothing. And the truth is, without him, that's who we are. We're nothing without Jesus. And the more love that we have for God, for what he's done, what he's doing, and what he will do for us, and the relationship that he has promised us in his word, if we want that, listen, we can learn to want him more. You know what? Let me, I'll throw this in. I ain't even preaching on tithing. Do you know what? When I loved God more than what I loved what I could pay with my money, it's when I started to tithe. When I quit loving what I wanted more than loving God, I started paying my tithes. I've never regretted that decision because I have never stopped loving God more than what I could buy with my money. It was a temporal thing. I haven't missed but one church service since we began this ministry. Why? Because I love being in church on Sunday more than I love going on vacation, more than I love going fishing, more than I love going golfing, more than I love whatever it may be. I love it more than the other activities, so I do it because I love it more. You and I do in our life what we love. You hear me? What we love. And sometimes what we love, we love more than what we love doing what God has asked us to do. And when we do, we fail to keep his commandment. Can everybody always come? No, I understand that. And if you have a justifiable reason, that's between you and God. It's never between me and you anyway. What you do with your finances is between you and God. All I can do is allow Holy Spirit to use me to encourage you to learn how to love God in every area of your life and you will never be dissatisfied with the result. Because loving God is the most important thing that you can do and the most important thing that I can tell you to do. Ever. To love Him. You know what? Our world, let, let's go here just for a minute. Our world, we've experienced some things. The one thing that we've experienced is a cold love. You ever had a cold love experience? You probably have. You know what that is? That's when it comes from the lips, but not from the heart. People, it's easy to say, I love you. Oh, it's really easy. Somebody comes along and buys your lunch. It's like, hey, I love you, right? Do you love them or did you love the fact that they bought your lunch? Should be both is right, but is it always? There are a lot of people will tell you what they want you to believe. You know that. It's a cold love. It's not real. It's not hot. It's not on fire. It didn't come from God. It's a cold love. There's another kind of love too. There's a fake love, a fake one. People will fake anything. It comes from a hidden agenda. And it does things for the wrong reason. It's because it's trying to get something from you. Trying to work you, manipulate you, trying to figure something out. Real love doesn't do it that way. Fake love. I, probably some of you is thinking about an episode in your life already. An experience that you've had. And may, many, sometimes probably many, and not just one or two. You know, probably at some point in time in our life, we've all done a little bit of the cold love. And we've probably done a little bit of the fake love. And sometimes we did it and we didn't even realize we were doing it because we didn't really understand what real love is. This is what we grew up with. This is how we learn. Did you ever spank a, a child and that child said, I hate you? But they didn't, did they? No, they loved you. But at that very moment, okay, they had a cold love. But it changed back. Yeah, we all make mistakes sometimes. We do. We can always correct mistakes by putting them back under the blood. When I was growing up, some of you ain't old enough for this, and yet I still see this. I see it in people. It's a free love. 
There are people in our world who want to be loved so bad that they'll just give away whatever that they've got because they crave love. They want love. They want something that's real. They want to be accepted. They want to be cared about. And you know what? They need it because God made us to love and to be loved. And if we grew up in a home where there was no love or we didn't have parents where there was no love or we got in a bad relationship where there was no love, people are craving that love. I can't drive through King's Highway at Cape Girardeau without craving an Andy's ice cream. How about you, by the way? James Brown special. Me and Tammy, we're on the same page. Do I love it? You bet. If I get close enough to it, will I crave it? You bet. You know why? Because real love craves things. And there are people who crave to be loved. You know what? That's what the church is supposed to be. That's who we are supposed to be collectively as a body. You should be able, and I pray that you can come through our doors and you can feel the love of God from us in this place. It's the way I want my home. I want you to come to my house and feel like it's a sanctuary, a place where you can feel the love of God and be loved and accepted and you can be free to be yourself. And you know what? God offered us free love. It didn't cost us anything. It cost Jesus everything for a short time. We have the ability to love. You know what? According to Revelation 2 verse 4, there's a dead love too. Because he addressed the church, all right? And he said, you left, you've lost your first love. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou has left. You know why they left it? It died. It died. When something dies, you just leave it behind. It's not no good to you anymore. Saddest experiences we have in the church is when people been in church and been in church and been on fire for God and then all of a sudden you quit seeing their face and they start going the opposite direction and then, you know, the last word that you hear is worse than the first that you had. Sometimes if we're not cautious, we can let love die. We've seen it happen in church. Most people, when they first get saved, they love God. I'm telling you, they, the new experience, all right, is enough to cause them to love God. They're on fire. They're inviting their neighbors. They're bringing people with them. They stand up and testify. They want to do something in the church because they've loved, they're loving God. It's all new. We like new things, do we not? And sometimes we love the new things that are in our life. New converts love God. And sometimes, you know, the embers begin to fade. The fire burns down. It's harder to maintain that. Solomon said, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. What happens in the church is people quit feeding the fire that keeps their love of God burning hot and burning bright. And yes, you and I, we have been guilty. So we, all you got to do is say, oh, yeah, amen. It's true. We get tied up in our world. We get busy. We're going here. We're going there. We got this happen. This happened. This, this, they, they need us. This needs us. And all of a sudden, it's like we put God on a back burner. Amen? Sometimes we need to look for our first love back. We need to feel like we first did. I think a scripture that Sammy loves talks about that in Psalms. Does it not create in me a right heart? Take me back to where I was. That's what David was praying. Sometimes we need that. Hmm. Yeah, they lost their first love. And then, of course, there is the real love. I'm telling you, God's love is real. So many people just do not experience God's real love that comes because they don't know what to expect. They don't know what to expect. They know how people have loved them, and if God can't do any better than that, it's like, well, I don't know if I want any of it. Real love. When you're going through a crisis and you feel the presence of God because He loves you, when you're laying in a hospital on a ventilator and you're praying and you're saying, God, I'm, I'm not ready to go. I'd like to stay. And there's a peace that passes understanding because God's love is there with you. When you've lost your parents, 
and you don't know how you're going to live without mom and dad in your life anymore. And you realize that you just became an orphan. And God comes in and you experience real love. I can't imagine what it would be like to lose a child or a grandchild. I do know this, I would want God with me the whole way. We face a lot of things in life and it's God's love that gets us past one day to the next day to the next day. It's God's love. It's what Jesus talks about in Luke chapter 4 when he said, I am anointed to bind up the brokenhearted. Remember that? Preach deliverance to the captive. It's the love of God that comes in and ministers to the need of the believer because it's real. It's real love. It's what everybody that I know needs. There's hardly ever a day goes by but what we don't need to experience the real love of God. You're setting out on a trip. You're going to travel. You know what? You need God to go with you. You need to realize that His presence is with you as you drive down a highway. It's real love, knowing that God is there. It's reading the Scriptures, and you find a promise, and you think, and God points it out and lets you know, hey, that's my promise. That's God's love speaking to you. Do we have real love for anybody? You know what? God placed it in you. If you've never found it, you need to look for it because it's there. Real love. The kind that enables you to love your neighbor as yourself. To walk two miles when, when the evil person wants you to walk a mile. When someone asks you for your coat and you think, well, here you just well take my cloak as well. The kind of love that feeds the hungry, gives drink to the thirsty visits the homeless, takes care of the widows and orphans. Real love. It's in you, every one of us, today. God put it there. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, Apostle Paul said that we are to walk in love. He was saying that's our conversation, that's our lifestyle. And walk in love as Christ also loved you, has given himself for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. So I don't walk in hate, I don't walk in bitterness, I don't walk in jealousy, I don't walk in, I walk in love. Preacher friend that I had, we went to church there for six months one time. His, his famous saying was, we're, God's, we're loved children of a loved God. Love children of a loved God. And the way that God loved us is how we can love others the same way but we have to walk in it. It has to be who we are daily. He said we love him, we keep his commandments. We don't pick and choose. You can't pick which ones you want to keep, which ones you don't. You can't say that don't apply to me. It's God's word. It applies to us all. I got to keep his commandments. That means I obey them. I do them when I can. I do what I know. I do what I understand. I am a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Because I love them. And one of my favorite verses, John 13, 35. Listen, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, by the love that you have one to another. World's watching us. They see how we treat each other. They see how we talk about each other. They see what we say. They watch us gossip, backbite, hearsay. They know, they see all that stuff. They see the looks when their back is turned. The world's watching us. They know whether we got any real love. You see, the world understands fake love, cold love. They do. They understand this, the kind that the devil has put out there. That's all they know. So when they see real love, they're like, wow, I need to, I need to see more of that. Why do you think that Jesus drew, uh, drew such a huge following everywhere he went? Why did 20,000 of them go out of the cities and country and gather on a hilltop and listen to him preach for three days. Why? What drew them? They felt something from him that was different. It was real. He had a word they wanted to hear. He didn't turn people off because he was cold and indifferent. He turned people on because he was full of love. Full of love. How could he just walk up to men that he never met and say, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men? 
Why did James and John, Peter and Andrew drop their nets and walk with him? Why did Matthew leave his tax collector's office and come follow him? Why did Luke, a physician who had a job and a good livelihood, leave his and follow him? Many of them had families. It weren't like they were all bachelors looking for a place to go. They were drawn to him by the love that he emitted from his life. This is who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to walk in love and emulate he who died for us, rose again for us, lives for us. You know what? Every good thing you expect to receive from God comes by walking in love and keeping his commandments. I want you to get this today because I don't like to share this with people sometimes. People say, why did this happen to me? What's this going on now? Everybody thinks that God's just going to do any and everything that they want when they want it, and yet they don't want to pay a price. They don't want to do what they know is right. They haven't prayed for a month, and today they feel bad, and they want God to heal them. They haven't put anything in an offering plate for a year, and yet they want to be able to be out of debt. If we don't keep His commandments, it's because we don't love Him, and if we don't do that, God's not going to do for us the things that people want done in an instant, in a moment. That's not a popular message. That won't win me any favors with a lot of people. But it's important that we know the truth because it's a truth that does what? It makes us free. We need to get free from the hate, the bitterness, the disappointment, the deceit, that's been in our life so that we can truly love God the way that we're supposed to and live our lives in our world the way that other people can see Jesus within us so that when we give them an invitation or make them an offer, whatever it may be, they don't reject us because they've watched our life and they don't feel the love. You're awful quiet in here. It's an amen. It's an amen. Now, let me ask you that same question we had earlier. Do you love what you want more than what you need? Do you love what you want more than what you need? See, it's it's a pretty good question. It's something we're going to think about. We're going to to study on that a little bit. We have a hard time defining sometimes what we need, and yet our greatest need is obvious. We need to love God more. Our love for Him needs to be stronger. It needs to be more evident. It needs to be proof to our world that we love. And if we truly love God, we'll love people, God's people, the way that we're supposed to. Amen? Love is an action word. (laughs) Your actions prove who and what you love. You hear me? Love is a fruit of the Spirit. Fruit is what we judge when we look at other people. It's the first of number nine, love, because it's the greatest. If we don't love, we don't have fruit, there's no inspection can be done. Let's be blessed today. Listen up, children. You approach each day your battles. Don't let your hearts faint. Fear not. Do not tremble. Neither be afraid. For the Lord our God is he that goes with us to fight for us against all of our enemies to keep us safe. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face to shine upon you and is gracious to you. The Lord lifts up his countenance upon you and gives you his peace.